and welcome to another one of my videos. In this one I'd like to try a little bit of an experiment because some of you have commented on my voice in a nice way. You said that, that it is relaxing and puts you to sleep. So um, I thought to myself, well, let's try this little experiment. I'll, I'll tell you about a dream, a literal dream I had a few weeks ago. Um, I wrote it down and I'll narrate it to you and see if this can spark your imagination and help you sleep better. Close your eyes. Gus, it's been a beautiful night. Now I feel like a bit of burglarizing. But Hamish, it's probably closed by now. No, Gus, not that one. A bit of burglarizing, you know. Go get some stuff. But Hamish, you can hardly stand perpendicular, let alone go get some stuff. Besides, I don't think the owners would like that anyhow. Never you mind, Gus. Just leave it to me. And they teetered and tottered the best as they could down the lane. Now there's a good-looking prospect, Gus. Don't look like there's nobody home. Lights are out and pretty as you please. Isn't that Miss Pimpleton's place, Hamish? Never you mind. Looks right for the pickin' to me. Here, help me over the wall. Do you have to go over the wall, Hamish? No burglar riser worth his salt would do it any other way, Gus. And he heft and humped over the wall, and noisily fell into the rubbish can on the other side. Gus was quick to act, and shot through the garden gate a few paces away, and helped Hamish to his feet. I don't get a good feeling about this, Hamish. I don't want no part of it, none at all. Oh, Gus, it'll be fine. No, Hamish, do it yourself if you must, but I just won't. Have it your way, Gus. Just help me with the door before you go, my good man. The French doors opened with a creak, and Hamish tiptoed inside. It was dark, but moonlit enough to make out a number of silhouetted objects and patches of dimness. Ah, some very sparkly-looking jewellery on the sideboard. I'll have those, thought Hamish to himself. They must be worth a fortune. As he felt his way around the table, he picked up a tablet. My goodness, a priceless Egyptian tablet. I bet that'll go for a tidy sum. And he crept forwards to a vertically shaded doorway. Hamish froze. There on the bed was the first real striped tiger he had ever seen with his real own eyes in his real own life. What was he to do? The tiger stirred and lifted its head. All Hamish could do was to freeze a stiff and keep as silent as he could with his eyes tightly shut. What if I run? He'll probably have me for breakfast before I get to the door. So freeze and hope he would go away was the order of the day. A light thump could be heard as the tiger got down from the bed. Then it could be sensed padding towards him. Hamish doubly stiffened and froze as the tiger's paw rubbed long and hard against his leg. He daren't move. Then, on his opposite hand, he could feel the rasp of a raspy cat tongue. Hamish started to sweat. Was he to be eaten alive for his sin of breaking and entering? He continued to sweat, a sigh of relief, as the tiger eventually padded away. At least this time he had avoided being eaten alive. I'd better get out of here, he thought to himself, and evaluated his escape route. He could not go back whence he had come, as the tiger had gone in that direction, so he stretched his tippy toes to the maximum and passed through the vertically shaded doorway and down the hall to the next room. Surely there was another door there to exit from, and sure enough there was. But the shadow of Miss Pimpleton appeared large as life in the frosted glass of the front door. As the door handle turned, Hamish just had time enough to take a quick step back into the corner between a table and the wall. The hasty step sent the sparkly jewels from the sideboard and the priceless Egyptian tablet clattering to the floor. Hamish held his breath and once again clamped his eyes shut, hoping reality would go away. Miss Pimpleton groped her way into the room, muttering to herself. Her grope found a candlestick and a candlestick holder, and a pack of matches beside it. A match was struck, 
which could be heard by Hamish in the darkness, and he hoped that he would fade into the wallpaper. With the glow of the match, the tiger immediately appeared on the scene in its two-part form. Why, Pinky, there you are, perky, you naughty little cat. Did you miss me? And they purred as she fussed over them. Oh, my, you've been busy. How did you get Winifred and Tommy's toys in here? I must get them back to them next time they're over to play. And she retrieved the priceless plastic jewels in the not-so-priceless plastic Egyptian tablet from the floor. Then she noticed something odd beside the table she was about to put the toys on. Her eyesight and binocular glasses did not function so well in this kind of lack of light, so instead of stowing the toys, she crept forward with candle held even further before her. Hamish's eyes were clamped even tighter, and even though it was probably time for a breath by now, he kept it in as firm as he could and sweated out the one too many drinks he had had early in the evening. The first thing Miss Pimpleton noticed, with a pair of workman's boots in the corner, she crouched to examine them, and Hamish felt the warm glow of the candle growing on his legs. The glow got warmer until warm was hot. Miss Pimpleton was confused. The warm glow had gotten hot enough by now for the heat to rise up Hamish's shorts, and all of a sudden the hairs on his legs and other things ignited. In the police station later that night, a distraught Miss Pimpleton was calmed by the sergeant in charge as he wrote up the case. A very sore and repentant Hamish declared he would never again go a burglarizing. It was just not worth it.